Hello, my name is George Langford. I'm from Potty Casey, North Carolina, and I was interviewed by the History Makers in 2008 and 2009. I am a professor and a scientist, and I encourage all of the aspiring young people who want to be scientists to pursue their dreams. Aloha, I'm retired Judge Sandra Sims from Honolulu, Hawaii. I was interviewed by the History Makers in December 2019, and I'm so excited to be a part of the 20th anniversary celebration of this remarkable organization. My appointment in 1991 as the first black woman judge in Hawaii was a historic moment and one which enabled me to have a part in ensuring our state's continued legacy of working for improved access to justice, inclusion, and diversity. Hello, my name is Pierpont Mobley and I'm from Washington, D.C. I was interviewed by the History Makers in 2014. Hi, my name is Eunice Trotter. Nobody else is doing it like the History Makers. And I just implore you to check out the archive of interviews that have been done down through the years about so many achievers who are no longer with us. And guess what, people? If it wasn't for the history makers, generations to come would never know they existed. So I just want to say good luck and much success to the history makers. Hello, I'm Masekwa Myers from Chicago, Illinois. I became a member of the History Makers family in 2018. I am a producer, director, writer, arts administrator, actor, and youth mentor, and proud to be known as a cultural keeper in the arts for the African American experience. Thank you, Juliana Richardson, and all those involved for 20 years of documenting our oral history. It is so important and so necessary for the generations that come behind us. Thank you. One night I cried out, and it had gotten too hard, too much work, too few resources, too many demands. But then the miracles came. They came in the form of people, resources, expertise, moving us forward in new and unexpected ways. There was truly hope at the end of the tunnel. Good evening, I'm Darren Walker and I serve as president of the Ford Foundation. 2017 was a special year for the history makers. Their staff and crews traveled to Savannah, Miami, Jackson, Mississippi, Little Rock, Arkansas, and Dallas, Texas to both hold regional receptions and to interview area history makers. But more importantly, history makers convinced Franklin Thomas, the first African-American head of the Ford Foundation, to have his life and career honored with the PBS taping of An Evening with Franklin Thomas. Every day, I reflect that my work stands on his shoulders. In fact, I was 20 years old at the time of his appointment and had no idea where my career would lead me. I had no idea that I would now lead the organization that he transformed. In 2017, New York's business and civic community came out to honor this great man. Let's take a look. People get ready. There's a train coming. Don't need no ticket. You just get on board. All you need is faith to hear the diesels humming. You don't need no ticket, you just thank the Lord. People get ready, there's a train to Jordan. Picking up passengers from coast to coast. Faith is the key, open the doors. And for them, there's hope for them all. Among them, love, love them all. There ain't no room for the hopeless sinner. Who would hurt them all? All they got is to save them all. all. Have pity on those chances 
growth in it. For there is no hiding place against the kingdom strong. Come on now. This site is truly a tapestry of culture of all of our humanity. So that's a tremendous history in those years. And trust with the donor, it takes time. Okay, so hold on. I you can talk to her later. IBM was the type of company uh, that I would be interested in working in because of what they stood for. You know, clearly a technology leader in the marketplace, but at the same time, it was a company that viewed diversity as a business, that you want the best and brightest uh, across uh, various constituencies, generating um, ideas and making contributions that can make a, that can make a difference um, in our industry. And uh, that's what IBM stood for, and that sort of value proposition resonated extremely well with me. I was the first black person in a white collar position at the Herald, because the other people who blacks who worked there, they they were either um, the, the domestic worker who cleaned the buildings, building, or the press, the guys who worked in the press room mixing the ink. I was I was the first, and the black guys were so proud of me. They were so happy to see me there. They didn't know what to do. Uh, my dad was starting to build Johnson Products Company, and the best form of transportation was a station wagon that he could load up with product and go to Detroit, Cleveland, uh, Kansas City, Philadelphia and sell what was then our first product, Ultrawave. And that was really my um, breeding ground, if you will, that developed an interest in business. And Johnson Products Company through the years obviously has been a uh, a legendary institution in the black community. I remember it like it was yesterday when I had the uh, first client. Uh, this lady walks in, much younger than me, or maybe about the same age. I would say uh, back then, what was I, 29, somewhere in there. But they were very cheap. They were looking for someone that they could get for almost nothing. And ba da, there I am. So her plan was to get all she could get from me at a very good price. Okay, she and her husband. And uh, my plan was to get all I could get from them and possibly get published. I wanted to make the house spectacular and they were willing to use me to make that happen. So we all kind of got what we wanted. You live, you die, you dream tonight. Tides rise, they fall. You play, you run, you sing, you dance, hear love that calls. With silent steps that leave their print to take you there. With gentle lips, with tender notes, you
and silent steps that leave their print to take you there. With gentle lips, with tender notes, you make the words come true. And silent steps that leave their print to take you Take me there. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to my dearest friend, my brother, in every sense of the word, Franklin Thomas. Tell me, 
That was truly wonderful. The Ford Foundation had recently funded the History Makers' work in New York 
allowing them to add over 200 interviews to the archive, almost doubling the number of interviews from previous years. Our partners at the New York Public Library recently announced that it is making the History Makers digital archive available free of charge to anyone with a public library card to access from their desktops, laptops, and mobile devices. So 2017 was also the year that the History Makers hosted its first program on Martha's Vineyard to draw attention to the fact that we are at risk of losing 20th century African-American documentation. We look forward to what is in store for this great organization. But for now, I want you to sit back, learn, and listen to an evening with Franklin Thomas. I'm Almita Cooper. My interview was recorded by the History Makers on May 10th, 2013. Congratulations to Juliana Richardson and the History Makers on the 20th anniversary. Hi, I'm Norma Jean Darden, and I'm here toasting the History Makers for 50 years of excellence. I was interviewed about six years ago because I have spoon bread catering, and we have catered to three presidents, including Obama, uh, President Clinton, President Bush. So here we are at Spoon Bread, and I was also cited for being one of the historic black models for the models of Versailles, and we are credited with bringing American casual fashions to Europe. And we've been honored at the Met and in a film. So here's to you, black history makers, Norma Jean Darden saying hello. Hello. I'm Shirley Barber James. I'm from Savannah, Georgia, and I was interviewed by History Makers in January 2007. My name is Herbert Winfell. I'm a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I'm originally from Ghana and was interviewed by the History Makers in 2012. I'm delighted to be here as part of this 20th anniversary celebration. Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Betty Cato Strudwick, and I practice for approximately 60 years in pediatrics in Washington, D.C. My late husband and I, Dr. Warren J. Strudwick, were privileged to have been selected by the history makers as among the first histories taken and recorded. I congratulate the history makers on this important uh, anniversary. And uh, I am certain that they will be there for future generations in the years to come. The following program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, Apple, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org. From the streets of New York's Bedford-Stuyvesant neighborhood to the corporate boardroom, his career has been one of legends. Lawyer, foundation president, friend of Nelson Mandela, he aided New York City in its time of need. His name is Franklin Thomas. The History Makers, the nation's largest African-American video oral history archive, is proud to present An Evening with Franklin Thomas, featuring Gloria Steiner, Vernon Jordan, and others. It is my deep honor and pleasure to be here to celebrate my good friend and your good friend and democracy's good friend, Franklin Thomas. When I think of... When I think of... I think of... When I think... I think of... When I think of Franklin Thomas. When I think of... Franklin Thomas. And I certainly think of him often. I think of... Incorruptible. Temperance. Dignified. Insight. Quiet competence. Mentor. Intelligence. Persistent. Discipline. Excellence. Analytical ability. Extraordinary judgment. He's a leader. Leader. Natural leader. 
my hero. Tempered steel, you know that steel when you flick it, it goes ping because it resonates. The role model. Legend. Wise man is a very cool guy. I came to New York in the spring of 1970, and Michael Sviedoff, who was then big at the Ford Foundation, knew me, and he knew Frank Thomas. He said that we needed to meet each other. He convened us at the Palm Restaurant, and we had Good whiskey, good steak, good wine. And that was the beginning of not only many, many, many dinners, but a friendship, a sharing, and caring about each other and each other's families and sharing our ambitions and aspirations. We did a lot of things together. We also different. Frank is quiet, cool. I am at times not so quiet and not so cool. There's a song we sing about it, like the tree planted by the river, it shall not be moved. Frank was immovable. Somebody wrote that friendship is the medicine of life. That's me and Frank Thomas. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to my dearest friend, my brother, and every sense of the word, Franklin Thomas. tonight to be so special <laughs> for you and for your life and your work that have touched so many. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I did in my time. <laughs> and, and it is richly deserved and earned. And I'm proud to sit here on this stage with you and with Gloria. I actually got a little excited about this, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Those who know me, that's a, a somewhat of a rarity, but uh, uh, that's how I feel. I feel a sense of uh, fulfillment, not the end of things, but a continuation of things that matter. Uh, I think about uh, the friendships I've made and continue to make and how much I care about each of you and what you're doing. And I think about my sisters, who were all older than than me, and uh, as the only brother at that point, uh, pretty nurtured by them. It helped me, frankly, have a bit of a joy about what was possible in my life. Uh, and tribute to your sisters who taught you how to dance, right? Yes. I remember stories of going down in the basement, right, and learning it, right. okay, right. <laughs> and you especially love Ella Fitzgerald. So here to sing one of Ella's songs tonight is none other than the jazz legend, Diane Reeves. a tree and I feel like I'm clinging to a cloud I can't understand I get misty just holding your hand walk my way Or it could be the 
sound of your hello that music I give I get misty whenever you're near you can see that you're leading me on but it's just Don't you notice how hopelessly I'm lost? That's why I'm following you. Oh, for people, people, people on my own. Could I wander through this wonderland alone? Never knowing my right foot from my left, my hat from my glove. I'm so misty. You wouldn't have been aware that we were poor in the financial sense because it was church on Sundays, it was uh, uh, storytelling, it was listening to FDR on the radio when he spoke. My friend, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States. We all gathered around for that. The living room had uh, two pictures, FDR and the Queen of England. My mother came from Barbados and uh, came when she was, I'm guessing, around 15 years old. So I grew up with her example of, I can't say she was fearless, but she behaved as though she was fearless. She was proud, um, and it didn't matter whether she was ironing somebody's shirt or whether she was down in Washington during the war. She had a lot to do with his calm and confidence that allowed him to always know he was not less important than anybody else and not more important either. Well, Frank, he was in the Boy Scouts out of uh, Concord Baptist Church, which was a major institution in Bedford-Stuyvesant. I wanted to join the Boy Scouts because I had witnessed a parade with the scouts marching and the drums and bugles playing and all the rest of it. And the question was, how do I get from where we live to where the Boy Scout troop is? And that's street gangs all over the place. So I, I said, uh, I guess to my mother or my sister, I have to get a bike. Most of us did, we were in church and Boy Scouts. It was like a normal rite of passage. That's the way everybody went. He enjoyed uh, being part of the Drum and Bugle Corps and he was a drummer. By now, I'm leading the Drum and Bugle Corps. And as we would pass each other, the goal was to drum out the other. Guys. So when we passed them, they were supposed to be confused at the end of that and maintaining the rhythm that they had. That, that was the way it worked. So there was both the joy and the beauty of it, and there was also the competition. Frank and I actually met uh, at Franklin K. Lane High School. It was just something a little different about Frank. He seemed to know, you know, where he was going. 
and as if he was being prepared to go there. They said that w when you go to the lunch room there, when Frank's around, there are a pile of books there and everybody's sitting around. And then when lunch is over, everybody gets, gets up and leaves, and Frank's left there, all the books were his. <laughs> we both uh, made the varsity uh, basketball team. Frank was around 6'4", and in those days, that was a big guy. We thought that we could have gone all the way to city championship. And Frank Thomas, with his smart self, completed all his coursework mid-year. So we didn't have Frank for the second half of the season. And we thought we could make it without him, but we didn't. We laugh about it, obviously, but uh, they didn't win the championship that year. Lou Rossini was the coach at Columbia, and I went up for a visit, and uh, some of the players on their team were pretty well known, good basketball players. There weren't more than three or four per class, so that at any given time, you, you wouldn't see more than uh, 10, maybe 11 uh, uh, black students there. Well, what was significant is Frank was the only black basketball player on our team. And one of the games that we played was against one of the top teams in the country. When we got there and after we had checked in, we went down to the uh, dining hall to eat with the rest of the players and they wouldn't allow Frank to eat. But I was the captain of the team, so I mean, if I, if I, if I don't go, the team doesn't go. So uh, we would always find another uh, place that we could eat at, but it was crazy time. Frank and I took uh, American history. Uh, he was a, he had a different professor than than I did, and uh, uh, I always remember he was asking, he said, well, "What what's your guy like? What's Shenton like?" I said, "He's really good." And uh, he said, "Well, he said my guy is one of these professors who." thinks that the Civil War was about economics. The NAACP uh, had an initiative on campus that I got involved with. That they would create these teams of people who would go to the apartments or rooms that were listed as available. And the first group to go would be a person of color and if that person didn't get the room or apartment, they would then follow up with a Caucasian person seeking the same apartment with substantially similar uh, background. The college wasn't happy about it, but they didn't uh, interfere with the student initiative. He went from Columbia to the Air Force where he served for four years. I got assigned to the Strategic Air Command, Curtis LeMay and that whole group. I became a senior navigator. I got assigned to a wing that was a strategic reconnaissance wing, as they were called. So we were traveling all over the world, offloading fuel to our aircraft that had to fly at much higher levels than, than we did. We get started and we're heading over towards Europe and he looks okay to me. Everything is going pretty fine. So I, do, I step away from being over his shoulder, which is where I was in the beginning. And uh, then I get a call by the co-pilot who says that we have to report in it in the next 10 minutes or so. And uh, the navigator is not sure where we are. So I go back to him, and by then the perspiration is just draining down his face, and he's got out all these, his charts from his earlier career as a navigator, and he's struggling. And we figure out the last point that we were certain of, what the headings have been since then, what the speed has been since then. Those kinds of assignments, I mean, I didn't seek it, it just, they just happened. When he got ready to leave after his four years, um, he was, uh, in his departure, uh, taken into the 
office of some of the military people and they said you will you really have a, can have a great successful career in the military and you're just the right kind of person and that wasn't really what he wanted to do. One of the men followed him out into the hallway and said uh, you know you would have you could have had a great career I believe everything that was said in the room um, but you've chosen not to do it and I think that's the right choice for you because the, the, the fruit is really on the end of the limb. Um, it's not so easy to pick, and uh, you're doing the right thing. It was like something out of a cheap paperback thriller, a plot to blow up national landmarks. The Statue of Liberty was one of the targets of four extremists, and a second target was that Shrine of Liberty in Philadelphia. Authorities say they then intended to bomb the Washington Monument. I was to prosecute that case and select people to work with me as a team on that case. A team uh, composed of Steve Kaufman, who's the chief of the criminal division, Pierre Laval, who was the chief of Paul's attorney, and, and uh, Frank Thomas. It was, a, it was an interesting case because you can have one point of view about protests and a different point of view about protests that is rooted in destruction. There were three defendants, three New York defendants who were plotting to blow up the Statue of Liberty. There was another defendant um, who was a Canadian woman. Robert Collier and one of his assistants, Michel Duclos of Montreal, who was affiliated with a group seeking independence for the province of Quebec. Another arrested was Khalil Saeed, who police say went to the Statue of Liberty to buy a model and further the plot with the fourth conspirator, Walter Bow. The woman member of the gang buried the explosive in a vacant lot, police say. She had been observed by the Mounties going to her car and her car didn't start. We went from gas station to gas station to gas station, and I'm saying, Frank, uh, plane to catch, uh, maybe we should be heading for the air. Pierre, in his calm way, Pierre, we've got a little time left. Let's just do a few more stations. So, sir, um, we are investigating a woman by the name of Michelle Duclos. This is her picture. Uh, do you by any chance uh, know this woman? Have you ever seen her before? And he starts to tell us, yes, I know Michelle Duclos, a lovely person, an idealist, a wild radical. She's been my customer here in the gas station for a long time. Oh, my God, had we hit pay dirt. And not long after that, um, she became a government witness, um, um, the crucial government witness in this case. In a way, the 1965 trial was a precursor of 9-11. When people talk about terrorist trials, this case is rarely, if ever, mentioned. But if you look at it historically, it should be part of the litany because that's exactly what it was. Morgenthau's chief assistant became police commissioner. Uh, he asks me to go with him. My parents introduced Frank to Vince and resulted in Vince asking Frank to be the deputy police commissioner for legal affairs. A couple of my friends in the U.S. Attorney's Office and others said, Frank, why are you going to leave the U.S. Attorney's Office? to go with, with, uh, with him, if Lindsay gets elected, uh, he's going to be out of a job. I understand what the consequences can be. So, true to the forecast, Lindsay gets elected. Strikebound New York continues to struggle on. 
strikers demand the release of their nine leaders, jailed for contempt of court. Union boss Mike Quill refused compromise. Personally, I don't care if I rot in jail. I will not call off the strike. Mayor John Lindsay, only two weeks in office, sets an example by walking 70 blocks to City Hall. Having a Bill of Rights inside the department was a positive circumstance which allowed the conversation to take place about having a civilian complaint review board. The year was 1966 and the mayor, John Lindsay, was being asked who was going to police the police. 1,000 veteran police officers had quit because of the civilian review board. John Cassis, chief of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, said, you show me an accelerated pattern of police brutality and we'll accept a review board, not a campaign promised by a politician. While there were good police officers doing their jobs, on July 21st, 1966, there was a group called Sponge, better known as the Society for the, the Prevention of Negroes Getting Everything. <laughs> and they were roaming the streets of Brooklyn, East New York. And trouble exploded on a hot summer night in New York. Rocks and bottles showered down, shots rang out, and an 11-year-old boy named Eric Dean was killed. We asked, when will they learn? And now to sing her own composition, ladies and gentlemen, jazz legend, Miss Common Lundy, when will they learn? When will they learn when will they know why don't they see they cannot grow running away living each day in the clouds where is the love have they no
From the towering grandeur of mid-Manhattan, it is only four miles across the river and into the slums to the place with the improbably patrician name of Bedford Stuyvesant. This place, a ghetto bigger than Watts or Harlem, bigger than any except Chicago's south side. 400,000 human beings, 95% of them Negro and Puerto Rican, packed into four square miles of growing blight. Senator Kennedy's encounter with the people of Bed-Stuy became a turning point for the government's role in community revitalization. What we brought together for the first time really is the city, private foundations, the federal government, and I think um, uh, most significant, uh, the private sector. Along with some private investment, $18 million is being pumped in by government and by foundations. A star toward meeting that demand is a Negro corporation headed by Franklin Thomas, a former deputy police commissioner. A second ingredient is a white corporation, keeping in the background, trying to attract outside business investment into the ghetto. The partner organization, the Development and Services Corporation, whose board consisted of major business leaders and whose staff was predominantly white. The structure was probably not ideal. That is, to have a separate business group, Manhattan-based, and to have a separate community group, and then have the two come together as partners, while conceptually okay, was probably, in human emotional terms, uh, not the most desirable way to go. Not everybody was 100% um, behind bed -Stuy. One, there was the skepticism. What do you guys think you're going to do? You know, you know, visionaries. And two, in some instances, we were competing. And three, you had the political, because most of the backing of the corporation came from Washington. So Frank now, he has to maintain his legitimacy with the black community, and he has to maintain his respect with, with the you know, white leaders of the city. Frank sent me out to a church-sponsored uh, community gathering to talk about the mortgage program and the mortgage pool. I was just expecting all these wonderful questions and how do we get involved. I got nothing but criticism. And we are not going to stand for it because once they take me out of my home for some rich men to make money off of it, that home won't stand because I won't stand for it to stand. When I went to work with Bed Stuy in 1969, they were located in a hotel near downtown Brooklyn. We moved from the hotel. We built a, a rehab, an old milk factory, Sheffield Farms, and we moved out to Sheffield. Um, he was able to expand 123 businesses. He was able to attract Freedom National Bank, Carver Federal Bank. He was able to establish $21 million in, in mortgages that uh, helped finance the uh, building of uh, housing for particularly for African Americans. Some of the finest brownstones you'll find in the city of New York, but people living in those homes couldn't get a mortgage to repair them, fix them up, you know, because the banks had said we're not going to uh, loan it, but start. We were impinging on people who had been able to capitalize on the problems. The mortgage brokers were there because the banks weren't lending. The Rest Rich Corporation got several of the big banks together and they set up a mortgage pool. We did a housing program, home improvement program, where we employed neighborhood young people, trained them in skills, and for $100, rehabilitated houses cosmetically in the neighborhood. We helped to, to build a facility for IBM to move in and, uh, and put one of their repair facilities in bed -Stuy. He always insisted that art be a part of the building. He always supported the Billy Holiday Theater, which is a national place of excellence. What we were doing was consciously, openly, and aggressively asserting that the future for development and the future for a healthy community and through it a healthy society is a future which involves black and white people working together. This was the first time that an African American was put in charge of a major foundation 
having the responsibility for billions of dollars. Franklin really was the point of the spear. Frank took over the Ford Foundation at a very challenging moment in the Foundation's history. There had been some uh, unfortunate setbacks in the markets. The Foundation had received some negative publicity. The Foundation lost roughly half of the real value of its endowment due to the tanking of the markets in 73 and 74 because it, there was an overhang of multi-year grant commitments so that even with the reduced assets, the foundation had to spend money that it really didn't have. And, and Frank put into place uh, spending policies and investment policies that held the foundation in good stead. Frank brought discipline, he brought order, he brought uh, a coherence to our work, and he worked diligently with the trustees to reset the foundation on a course for success. He made some very remarkable changes in the foundation. The first was calling it one foundation. The foundation he inherited was strong in programs, but the programs were in three or four or five separate units, and they were rather competitive, and they didn't relate to each other very much. And Frank's idea was we're all here working on human problems of survival and suffering, and we ought to be have a kind of common menu we work on so we can learn from each other. Because of Frank's style, because he was deliberative and reflective and inclusive, um, it gave people a sense of the future. And the future was an exciting future that he was building. It seems to me you're addressing the fundamental domestic issue in our country, how to ensure that our cities regain the economic vitality that has enabled them to offer hope and opportunity to generations of people who have come to this country seeking to better themselves. He is a bridge builder. In a time when we have leaders who are talking about building walls, Franklin Thomas has always stood for building bridges. Frank imbued in the foundation staff this passion to serve uh, uh, people in these ways. The philanthropic world had been unfortunately far too homogeneous, far too white. Ford really sort of walked the talk. He changed a practice that was common in foundations of having sort of a tenure system. If you were in a foundation, you could stay there for a long time. Frank's view was every so often there ought to be a change, whether it's every five years or six years. We need fresh perspectives, fresh ideas. It was really because of Frank's leadership that the modern Ford Foundation was saved. Sunday, September the 25th, 20,000 black South Africans came to mourn Steve Biko. The name that would always come up in terms of who was Seminole, who from America was really sleeves rolled up in the trenches with them, the name was always Frank Thomas. We were very dubious about philanthropy. We were fighting for rights. We were fighting for liberation. We were fighting for freedom. We weren't fighting for handouts. The liberation movements made huge contributions, but those contributions would not have come to anything had it not been for the work of South African activists on the ground inside the country. And our work was only possible through the support of the philanthropic world. I don't think anyone who's visited South Africa can come away unaffected by that country, by its, the potential of its people and by the tragedy of the apartheid system. His study was on the bookshelf of every CEO in the country. In May 1986, he got a group of the Broderbahn to, to come to Glen Cove in Long Island privately, off the record, to meet with the ANC and Becky and those people, they had never talked. They want to promote dialogue, connections between the ANC and important figures in white South African society. Franklin began to play the role of a uh, trusted convener. 
bringing different forces together that would never have been in the same room otherwise. So we're all gathered at, uh, in the conference and we're taking on various subjects and suddenly this one individual from ANC, from the London delegation of ANC stands up and threatens Peter DeLonga publicly. I will kill you. And he repeats it two or three times. I will kill you. Frank said now, calm down, hold on. We've come to talk. And from that point on, for the next three days, he calmly got the sides together and he put Mbeki together with the head of the Bruderbahn in a separate meeting. DeLonga, as the head of the Bruderbahn, coming out of that Long Island meeting, comes back and convinces Africana leadership that now is the time to negotiate. And that sets the table, if you will, prepares for many of the things that the clerk sets out to do when he becomes president. People serving prison sentences merely because they were members of one of these organizations will be identified and released. The government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. In the name of peace, democracy and freedom for all, I stand here before you not as a prophet, but as a humble servant. And there's some tension between ANC and Nkata, Mandela Boulezi, because criticism is flying back and forth. Within an hour, the two sides were at war in the heart of the city. The principal leaders from all sides in this conflict have scheduled emergency talks for later this week. Uh, Boulezi proceeds to tell Frank about how um, upset he is about criticism that he think is coming from Nelson Mandela. And Mandela says to Frank explicitly, what would you advise me to do? And Frank, in so many ways, in so many words, says to him, find a way to mend the fences. Our daily dues as ordinary South Africans must produce an actual South African reality. One of the important things that happened after the elections, black uh, South African lawyers have been held, you know, outside the courtroom, if you will. Ford Foundation began to work with the Black Lawyers Association. Franklin was very key in funding them and their education center. This is where history really uh, shows how powerful he is. Powerful. He is probably the most powerful man that we don't know of. He went as an emissary, as history shows, as a friend. That's leadership. I'm one of the last remaining activists of the Black Consciousness Movement. Most of my comrades died in detention or were killed mysteriously. During the apartheid era, I was banished to the Limpopo province, where I started a community health center. Fearful of going to jail for not being able to pay the builder, I asked Bishop Tutu for help. And he approached the South African Council of Churches which is where the Ford Foundation and Franklin Thomas came in. Being blown up by apartheid agents, in my case, turned out to be a blessing in disguise. I was free when I came out of hospital to work full time on a new constitutional vision for South Africa. The problem was who would finance that project? And of course, it was Ford Foundation 
Franklin Thomas, who didn't want to only bring down apartheid, but wanted to create democracy on the ashes of apartheid. One thing we can be sure of, in South Africa at least, where there are legal people who are activists and idealists, the name of Franklin Thomas will resonate and continue to resonate. I had an instant connection to the struggle against apartheid, and the Ford Foundation supported me. So thank you, Franklin, for that. <laughs> and now, Tomiko. Zinto! think about, you know, who were the African-American males who were like half a generation ahead of me, to a generation ahead of me, but, but 10 to 20 years ahead of me, who I could emulate and would want to emulate, would want to be like and follow in their footsteps. Frank was one, Vernon Jordan was one, Cliff Wharton was the third. When Franklin came into being, not too many blacks were on the boards of directors of major of Fortune 500 companies. Bill Paley decided that he needed to expand the reach of his board. So in walks a 37-year-old person from Bed-Stuy, 36-year-old kid from the Midwest in Marietta Tree. One, two, three. Each of us one uh, month apart, and it was hysterical. After I went on the CBS board and became acquainted with Frank, uh, Erwin met him and he then came on the Cummins board. Erwin Miller was one of the great statesmen. He founded the idea of trusteeship. He was just a wonderful human being and everybody who knew him or met him were blessed by it. In the 60s and 70s and almost into the 80s, the business council of CEOs of various businesses, and they met together, they talked together, they served on commissions together, they were on presidential commissions, they spent time in Washington. 
They cared about civil rights, free trade, quality in the society. They were very, very important. You talk to anybody on whose board Frank has served, and you will find the CEO of that company viewing Frank as the unique person to go to at any time of concern or need of advice. It's happened that every company that I know of that Frank's been on. He's able to step back and think holistically about the problem and really be counsel for the entire situation. One of the things that Frank was very uh, concerned and thought about a lot is how would one feel if what you're doing today, three or four years from that date, would be on the front page of the New York Times, would you still want to do it? And if you felt that you questioned that, maybe that was something that the company shouldn't be doing. The other board members had trust in Franklin in a time of crisis. It always impressed me that virtually, I, I think all the boys he was on, CBS, Citigroup, Cummins Engines, Frank would always end up being the lead independent director. He just commands that kind of respect. That's who he is. I believe Frank has paved the way for so many of us who, in terms of where we are today because of who he is and what he achieved. Frank also believes passionately that business leaders should be civic leaders and not just the inevitable concentration solely on the bottom line. And he has shown that in all his leadership, all his life. He cares deeply about community, he cares deeply about people. And it was no surprise that after 9-11, he was called on once again. This just in, you were looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center. A plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. The state of New York um, was, for anybody who was here, um, shocking. I had gone down to the United Way and we had jointly agreed that we needed to have a place where both New Yorkers and Americans and the world could contribute. So we thought that we would cleverly create an organization between the United Way of New York City and the New York Community Trust and that would need some dedicated staff and a leader. There was no infrastructure, there was nobody. There's only one person in the world that could do this job and chair this board. Laurie and I thought, in fact, Laurie did the asking, thought that Frank would just be an ideal person to lead this 22 effort. You need somebody with that sort of gravitas and an immediate credibility that Frank had. And he said, I'm gonna do it. Because he felt compelled as so many other people felt compelled, Frank stepped up and done a wonderful job. Once he made the decision to do it, he gave it his all, and with that incredible commitment and passion. Another source of enormous frustration by the families, and, and Liz McLaughlin alluded to it up there, going down and having to fill out the same paperwork again every two weeks. And we had her just show you on her desk what she yeah. has to fill out, and it's the same paperwork well, I every couldn't single agree time more. she goes down. And frankly, with the new program, those people who are already in the system will not have to fill out any additional paperwork. The reason I'm in this, coming out of uh, what I thought was retirement, was to try and be helpful. There is no perfect way to do this. I am pleased with the progress that's been made, both in coordination. I welcome the criticism. I welcome the pressure. I don't run from it. Uh, we are trying to be rational and practical and, frankly, wise in what we're doing. And Frank was masterful at trying to understand the pain and suffering of those who had lost loved ones those who had lost their livelihoods. It's Frank who figured out, okay, well, one of the things we have to do is we have to help the families that lost loved ones at the very beginning, in the short term. I have a very personal attachment to Frank's career. My son was a firefighter. He was 39 years old, and he died in the World Trade Center, okay, and left three little boys who are now in high school and college. Frank, unbeknownst to me, became a part of a commission, became a head of a commission that raised the money 
that is now sending has sent my first grandson to college. I tighten up when I can't tell you how I can express the gratitude that work he has done has helped my family. And the friendship he's shown, he was at my son's funeral. I wasn't an employee of his anymore, but he reached out and he's, he's, I consider him a great man and a great friend. And what is incredible about Frank is that he spans generations, he spans every segment of our society he can relate to. And he's made such a difference in every single thing he's done in his life. Franklin A. Thomas has made such a difference. He is a gift from on high. I have sought out his counsel on most every important career decision I've ever made. In the African American Heritage Dictionary, and in the vernacular, let me be bright, clear, and unequivocal. Frank Thomas is the man. Please join me in welcoming Franklin A. Thomas. What's there to say? <laughs> uh, a wonderful evening, a wonderful remembrance, and uh, a wonderful guide for the future to keep it up, to keep doing it, to keep being active. Um, we have a wonderful nation that continues to improve itself, and we need to not let anyone or any group start to separate us again. We need to stick together, and we'll all be stronger, and the villains will go on and they'll be rich and they'll do whatever they want to do, but uh, we'll have something that we can leave for those who follow us uh, that's worthy of all the efforts we all put in and uh, the respect we have for the values of the nation, the image of the nation, the intention of the nation to be even greater than it's been. So, thank you. For more information or to order your own copy of An Evening with Franklin Thomas, please visit thehistorymakers.org or call 866-914-1900. That's 866-914-1900. The preceding program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, Apple, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org.
The following program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, Apple, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org. Known as the Black Metropolis, Chicago was a beacon for African Americans from across the country, a nurturing place for those who would go on to the world stage. An Evening with the History Makers, Chicago Stories, explores this rich history that is Chicago's legacy. Hosted by actor-producer Harry Lennox and actress-director Regina Taylor. Hello. Mr. Harry Lennox. Regina Taylor, you are a sight for sure. <laughs> Brings me back to that wonderful evening we spent with the History Makers. Yes, an yeah. evening with the History Makers. That's right. You know, I'm looking at this paper today and seeing all the crime and violence. It reflects a city I don't much recognize. The news doesn't capture a fraction of what Chicago is, was, or can be. Let's try to recapture it ourselves a little bit with the great Teresa Griffin bringing us in to that wonderful evening we spent. What's too painful to remember? We simply choose to forget. So it's the laughter. We all on the mid-south side of Chicago. 204 East 83rd Street. 47th and Greenwood. 51st, uh, just west of Cottage. 3341 South Park, which is now King Drive. Oh, I remember the, uh, the ice persons up and down the uh, alley. The knife sharpener used to ride his bicycle there and sharpen your knives. The vegetable man used to come and scream up what he had. You know, like, I got watermelon corn. Red as a berry, sweet as a cherry. Wah, 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 la mille. Boy, you hear that? Daddy, can we get a water bill? <laughs> you can smell polar sausage and the and the, the onions being cooked in the air. Come back to our neighborhood, man, you're gonna, you're gonna smell some fried chicken, some catfish. It was all good, and we all share. People go in and out of people's apartment to, to bar salt and it wouldn't necessarily be home. <laughs> you know, it was just like a big family. In my neighborhood, if you stray even too far in terms of certain norms, the cliche is right. People down the street would come and tell your mother. That's sort of the kind of community where everybody on the block knew when I was supposed to be home. My, grand my great grandmother said she is not where I expect her to be. You all look for her and they look for me. If you went up to like 94th Street, you could run around in these huge, never developed vacant lots and look for snakes. <laughs> our neighborhood uh, included our church, which was on the corner across the street from our house, and our church had a bowling alley in it. If you could get on South Park, you felt pretty proud that that was the boulevard of note or of notables. I almost literally grew up in Madden Park when I was a kid. After school, that's the first place I would go, because that's where you could play baseball, you could play football. The neighborhoods that I grew up in, the maids and the doctors and the carpenters and the street sweepers, we all lived together. 
um, and I would say fairly successful. I suspect that there, if there was significant division, it would be division around color. You'd live next door to people who had a lot of money and you didn't have it. But nobody thought about that. It wasn't like there was a separation of class in terms of that. We lived in what is called a kitchen inn. It's a one-room apartment, usually a large apartment, uh, with uh, seven or eight rooms in it. Uh, one family would stay in the front and they had two rooms, another family in the middle and another family at the end. You shared the kitchen and you shared the bathroom. We were on public aid when we came to Chicago. And uh, we ate beans seven days a week. Red beans and rice, navy beans, kidney beans, butter beans. I remember I went to Mrs. Cockrell's nursery school in Michigan Boulevard Garden Department nursery school. I have wonderful memories of that. The smell of macaroni and cheese still turns me on. You know, Dr. Bowman reminds me of something. She talked about the smell of macaroni and cheese. That's Valerie Jarrett's mom, by the way. I remember the smells, the aromas of Funtown. It was a great amusement park on 95th and Stony. You know, for all of its reputation as a city of violence, Regina, Chicago at one point provided great sanctuary for any number of various people. When I grew up, there was a, a tremendous mix of people. There were athletes, politicians, preachers. One of them is the former governor of Massachusetts. Deval Patrick, and he'll tell you a little bit more. Good evening. My name is Deval Patrick, and I am a business executive, a lawyer, and the former governor of Massachusetts. But I grew up here in Chicago, right around the corner from the Robert Taylor Homes on 54th and Wabash. It was a real community. When I think back to the south side of Chicago when I was coming up, I can still see the horse-drawn wagon filled with straw and watermelons moving down the block in summer. We all kind of had the same story. Everybody was from down south. My grandmother was from Kentucky and had a third grade education. But she had strong middle class aspirations. She was strict about decorum. My mother was on welfare for a time but eventually got her GED at night and a job at the post office. She and my father split up when I was four. He was a jazz musician, a founding member of Sun Ra, who also played with Thelonious Monk, Count Basie, and Duke Ellington. The South Side then was segregated, of course, but felt more self-contained and self-sufficient. There was a mental toughness, probably a survival instinct, I think a lot of people in the neighborhood had that, and they imparted that to us. The good old days weren't always good, but that sense of community counted for something. And that needs to be rebuilt in our neighborhoods, in this and other cities all around the country. Start there, and the solutions to the rest of what ails us are easy. I grew up in a very tough neighborhood on the west side. A lot of uh, maybe the first generation of gangbangers, you know, when people were organized into teenage gangs, male and female. We didn't go south, you know, because there was this division between the south and the west side. People on the west side don't have nothing to do with people on the south side and vice versa. And we really didn't want to move from the west side because we had heard so much about the south side that it was bad. But then after we got on the south side, we heard that the west side was bad. Many of the people who came after World War II settled on the west side, and they were called the country bumpkins, the, you know. And the tradition of the old settlers was always on the south side in the, in the so-called Black Belt. There were two dominant gangs in the Chicagoland area. They were on the south side, they quote unquote were the Blackstone Rangers, and on the west side were the Vice Lords. If they tried to cross Cottage Grove Avenue, the white gangs across Cottage Grove Avenue would beat them up and run them back. So it was always a battle royal, and Cottage Grove was a boundary land. There were white gangs. Um, I remember some of the names, the Cleveland Aces and the Deuces. I mean, these guys had um, um, 14, 15 year old guys being led by. 17, 18 year old um, older brothers and sisters, and they were being taught to, to go to war. And as I'm getting a, uh, a hamburger or something, and 
It's about two or three o'clock in the morning. There's a car that pulls up beside me, and there's a guy blindfolded in the back seat. And it's apparently either a gang initiation or they're getting ready to off this guy. And he just pulls up beside me and then keeps going. Well, my first experience in uh, moving to Daryl Holmes was being beaten up by a girl gang after winning uh, a softball game. That was my own experience with girl gangs. During the time that I was uh, living in the housing projects, that was a boy thing. It wasn't a girl thing. I always thought if, you, if you're in a gang and you're in the wrong gang, that's a problem. Uh, if you're in a gang and you're not doing what they ask you to do, that's a problem. But if you're not in any gang, then you've got a chance. The kids, and, and, and that's an accurate description, that's the beginning of young people making their own rules. When, you, when it was no longer the adults telling the young people what to do, the young people started telling adults, this is what we're going to do. My name is Ruben Tannen. I was born in the Brownsville area of Chicago on the south side. My father worked in a stockyard when I was eight years old. He died of a heart attack, leaving my mother with four children to raise. We moved to a housing project, the Harrell L. Icky Homes. In the fifth grade, I was very fortunate to have a teacher, a wonderful teacher named Miss Luckett. What I heard Miss Luckett say was that we had found a home in Ickes, and greatness had found a home in me. By the grace of God and the loving support of my family and the community, I was able to walk fearlessly on my paper route. This was a paper route that started at 15th in Michigan and went to 25th in Michigan. Along the way, there was Johnson Publishing Company. In fact, it was John Johnson that said to me, Reuben, this is important to learn how to shake a hand firmly and make eye contact. A powerful man taking time to mentor a paper boy. Everything I needed to know to be successful in my first job in Universal Studios in the mailroom, I had learned on my paper route. My mother said to me, Reuben, the greatness in you is not determined by what you do for yourself. It's determined by what you do for others. That's the Chicago spirit I know. town in the country that had a comparable business growth of over 800 businesses. Uh, we were so far ahead of anybody. Some of the best, greatest black businessmen, the most successful ones, were in the insurance business. We had uh, Victory Mutual, we had uh, Bingo Bank, we had uh, Spring Liberty, Golden State Insurance Company. The black community had been discovered by the overall community. They didn't know there was that kind of money to be made. Yeah. That area along State Street, oh, say from 37th to 35th, was like a black Wall Street. You had a lot of success stories in there. You looked around, you saw all these great entrepreneurs. John Johnson with Ebony and Jet and Johnson Publishing. And George Johnson with Afrosheen and you know, Johnson Products. Tom Burrell, Burrell Advertising, Al Johnson, Al Johnson Cadillac. I use an expression, join Operation switch to Al Johnson Oldsmobile, and it worked. And people would say, what do you mean by that? And you tell them, from wherever you're buying, switch to Al Johnson Oldsmobile. We had just all these role models, and in each case, they were folks who had found a, a particular niche that they were really good at, and it built wonderful businesses around it. Well, it was unheard of to have a black product in a white chain store. So, Kid Baldwin, being the good businessman that he was, says, well, you know, it wouldn't help if I walked in there and said, you know, I want to go in. Why don't you, as a customer, go in? And that's the way Baldwin and Park House Sausage got into these stores. Well, I knew about Negro Reader's Digest, so I thought if all these people really want to know this information, maybe I could start a Negro Digest. So when I finally decided to, 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 to try and put it out, nobody else thought it was a good idea but me. <laughs> and I didn't have any money. So the question was, 
what was the best way to get started. And so I thought maybe, see you have to understand that there had never been a successful commercial black magazine before. My name is Linda Johnson Rice, the daughter of John and Eunice Johnson. My father came to Chicago with his mother from a rural town called Arkansas City, Arkansas. They came to Chicago, like many before them, in search of better opportunities and a better life. My grandmother, Gertrude, was a proud and strong single mother. She believed in him. And as a result of that, he believed in himself and his abilities. My father sent her a dozen roses every Sunday for her life. He was so very proud of her, and she was so very proud of him. He attended DuSable High School. He met my mother, Eunice, at a dance and soon after, they fell in love. Here you have my father, a brown-skinned man from rural Arkansas, and my mother, a fair-skinned doctor's daughter from a prominent family in Selma, Alabama. My father would have been the first to tell you that my mother was a tremendous asset to the founding and the building of Johnson Publishing. In fact, she's the one who came up with the name Ebony. Audrey Smaltz is my name, and fashion is my game. I lived in Chicago for two years. I married Dr. Stanley Hughes, and I became the fourth Mrs. Stanley Hughes. <laughs> but I must admit, I never met a woman here who knew how to live better than Mrs. Johnson. When I first started working for Mrs. Johnson, her passport said 1916. The next year, when I was going to Europe with her, the passport said 1926. <laughs> People would always ask me how I came up with the lines I used for the Ebony Fashion Fair. And I got them from newspapers, magazines, everywhere. When I would see a line that read well and sounded good, I kept it and I used it for the show. It could be anything at all, as long as it related to the show. But I want to take you back, take you back just a moment Oh, we had so much fun. Look, there's a Bill Blast suit. It's gray, the shoes are gray, the hat is gray, and the fox sling. And I would say, what to wear on Sunday when you don't get home to Monday? <laughs> we would only have the most fabulous clothes on the runway, like a gorgeous blue and yellow fox fur from Carlo Tivioli. And I would say to the ladies, ladies, you work hard. You deserve it. You owe it to yourself. There was another model. She was so elegant. And she would come out and just stand there. And I said, when the invitation reads, don't dress, consider this to wear. And the people would just, ah, oh, because it was drop dead elegance. There was nothing like working for Johnson Publishing. It started a career that I'm still involved with as I enter my 80th year. All of the major beauty companies in the United States, or worldwide, actually started here in Chicago. George Johnson was selling his product door to door from his car trunk. Only place in Little Rock that we could find to stay was in the dormitory at one of the colleges. And that's where we stayed, at the dormitory. I can remember even uh, trying to get gas. Uh, the attitude was all, with the attitude of the, of the, of the gas attendant was terrible. He had, uh, was so professional in his manner of doing the research, developing good products, um, packaged them real extremely well. And I was just naive enough to say, well, if he can do it, I can do it too, you know. So Johnson Products Company put the money behind it and put uh, Soul Train on TV. And Soul Train was terrific. Soul Train went on October 1971. I think we did around $12 million that year. In 1975, we were doing $37 million. 
My name is Eric Johnson. I'm the president and CEO of Baldwin Richardson Foods and the son of George Johnson. George went to the bank to borrow $250 to start his new venture. Confident that he had good credit, he presented his idea, discussed the new product, and showed the results of his early success. The bankers listened, and they informed George that he did indeed have good credit and a promising product. But business is risky, and they were going to do him a favor and not loan him the money, because if they did, he would surely lose his job and be unable to pay them back. The next day, he went to another branch of the same bank, sat down with the loan officer and explained that he wanted to take his family on a vacation to California, and he needed to borrow $250 for the trip. He was approved for the loan that day, and he had the money that he needed to start Johnson Products Company. In 1969, Johnson Products became the first African-American-owned company to ever become publicly traded on a major stock exchange. And in 1964, George Johnson became one of the founders and the chairman of Independence Bank of Chicago. My name is Terry Gardner. My mother and father founded Soft Sheen Products in 1964. They started the business in the basement of our South Side home. My father started out developing a hair conditioner. UPS would deliver raw materials to our home, and my dad would formulate products and hit the streets to sell them. Our car was always a station wagon or a van because we used the family car to deliver the orders. We assumed everyone was like us, working after school in a factory, <laughs> greasy clothes all the time. Uh, apparently, my parents were unaware of child labor laws. Uh, my three brothers and I started working and paying Social Security when I was eight years old. After 15 struggling years, Soft Sheen finally became profitable as a multinational, multi-million dollar company with over 33 brands in the 1980s. By the late 80s, my parents brought the new Regal Theater back to life. Additionally, my parents were the first black shareholders, investors in the Chicago Bulls. They helped finance the voters' registration campaign that convinced Harold Washington to run for mayor. He worked to register people to vote, not to tell them who to vote for, but to give people a voice. That voice is what we still need today in everything from our school systems to the policies of our city, state, and nation. As stakeholders, we have to be diligent about letting people know that we are paying attention. As a community, more than ever, we need to use our power. Hello, I'm Don Jackson. I've been in the television production business as CEO of Central City Productions for over 45 years. I have witnessed black producers, black ad agencies, and black businesses working together to support shows like Soul Train, which started right here in Chicago. Johnson Products Afro Sheen creative ads were developed by Vince Colors, the nation's first black advertising agency based here in Chicago. Then Tom Burrell of Burrell Advertising was in charge of buying advertising time on Soul Train for Afro Sheen commercials. These were the days when black businesses supported one another, creating programming first to make a difference and change the world. When we came up with the idea of doing a live two-hour television production of the Chicago Bud Billigan Day Parade, all signs were against it. We persevered. The parade proved to be a huge success. With the support of black agencies, ad agencies, the parade became the highest rated parade on Chicago's television. The Civil Rights Movement began years and years ago with people like A. Philip Randolph, 
with the sit-ins that we had in Chicago in the, in the early 40s. When I arrived in Chicago in 1946, it wasn't uncommon for you to go to 63rd Street and the sheriff of Cook County was moving out a black family from a house that the black man had paid for. This was a, everybody was talking about freedom and being against tyranny, except in your case. The four freedoms, does that apply to us? You're still in the Jim Crow outfit. This is a terrible thing. I've been in many demonstrations all across the South, but I can say that I have never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hostile and as hate-filled as I've seen in Chicago. It was here when we tried to march for open house and going to a Gates Park, and he was bricked in the head. It was here that you had this just uproaring of white ethnics attacking the drive to march for open housing. Uh, uh, it was here that you had a, a complex political machinery of uh, trying to destroy him and destroy our movement. There was a um, fire station, and um, the fire commissioner made some insensitive remark about this woman dying there and, and, and accused us of perpetrating this kind of thing. Well, the community went up for grabs. As I walked the streets in the riots at the request of the mayor until, uh, you know, I'm trying to get people to be calmed down, until one time I said, this is the last time I'm going to do this because, in a sense, you're getting co-opted. You're being asked to uh, quiet people down, and yet the conditions in which people live were not changing. There was never a shootout. It was a shoot-in. Now, I had known Fred Hampton. And this really touched me because he was a guy that I would see and joke with. I mean, he was about as harmless as, as you are sitting here. You know, he, the Panthers were feeding people in the black community. Ultimately, they set up uh, a plan to murder Fred and myself. Uh, and on December the 4th, 1969, they did, in fact, come uh, onto the west side to an apartment where Fred was standing. I was supposed to have been in that apartment. Um, and they shot that apartment up, killed Fred. The word came through at that time that, that Fred had been killed. And, you know, I remember being so stunned. I'm up there preaching, and I just broke down. I started crying. I couldn't, uh, I just, I just didn't, couldn't deal with it. And um, one of the fifth graders jumped up, and he said, I am Fred Hampton. Hanrahan and his deputies raided our churches after these kids, bust out our windows, our, knocked out our doors uh, with axes, came into the church, took the kids out, and then issued subpoenas to all of us pastors for grand jury, for aiding and abetting criminals from the law. That was my baptism by fire into the politics and the political life of Chicago. Shy Lights, Lou Rawls, Shaka Khan, Earth, Wind and Fire. Chicago is known for its music, from BJ Records to Chess Records, Jerry Butler, Etta James, The Dells. Let's take a look. Darling, you send me. Darling, you.
what I cut him with. My bilo kicked him in his side, stood and laughed while he died. So just there were so many nightclubs. There was the Rich Lounge. That was where Diana first started singing in the Rich Lounge. That was where I first met Diana. I don't want no sympathy. Cause I just cut my good man's throat. We had so many nightclubs. Fifty Fifth Street must have had four nightclubs everywhere you look. You had uh, the jazz joints uh, uh, at 47th and uh, at King or 47th and Drexel, the old Sutherland. I want to send you over to the Regal. He sent me to see Maynard Ferguson and Miles Davis on the same show. and I come out of that place. I wanted to play trumpet in the worst damn way. Now, Joe Williams was uh, another friend of mine that, uh, that uh, I helped because Joe was a very talented guy. Because it's you I hate to lose. What about settling? How you gonna keep me from meddling? He had a beautiful voice. Joe always wanted to sing ballads, you know, beautiful songs. It's Nat Cole. He was one of my idols. He was a voice that I had listened to from the first time I set foot in Chicago when I could hear music being played over the loudspeakers. It was Nat Cole. You made a plaything out of romance. And what were you thinking of? For now you call it madness. But I call it Hey, you had a deep voice, a concreto voice. It sounded like hearts was in it. walking on stage and Mihaly was there so rehearsing. I had to go back to the dressing room and uh, the uh, stage man said, uh, this one will give me goose pimples. She could just go into a beat that would uh, electrify you if you were sitting there, you know, just sitting in her concerts. She'd go into a beat with that big voice, studio work. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable.
Let me hear. Sing this one here. Oh, come on, baby, don't you wanna go? Let me hear. Oh, come on, baby, don't you wanna go? Back to that same old place where. If you care about people and you want to bring about change, politics and government go hand to hand. Good politics is good government. I was in the meeting in uh, our library uh, when, uh, when, when the committee indicated that we're going to have we going to have to have a black man. When Harold Washington people had the blue and white buttons, and it was almost like a wave, all of a sudden it became stylish for people to have that button. You want him? Yeah! You got him! Brought the city together. And you know, he said, no one will ever beat me being fair. That, 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 he, you know, you couldn't move him from that. And there were those who tried. Tell me, give him your finger! Yeah! I think, first of all, the black community should be proud of the image of, uh, of an African-American uh, mayor and who was running a city uh, with great skill. To be the mayor of the city of Chicago, you got to be able to be cool. An African-American had to break the ice and run for president, and it had to be someone who had the nerve and the guts to take the risk. And Jesse was that kind of person. We are gathered here this week to nominate a candidate and adopt the platform. This guy went around and he just, he really earned himself a role at the National Convention in the way that he had in 1984. I often say, you know, there are many um, books and stories that are written about the Jackson campaign. But I often say, for me, the legacy really is um, the Jackson campaign was a job training. When my name goes in nomination, your name goes in nomination. I was born in the slum, but the slum was not born in me. And it wasn't born in you, and you can make it. Wherever you are tonight, you can in make it. In a way, you could, you could argue that Jesse made it possible for the emergence of someone like Barack Obama. It is that fundamental belief, I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper, that makes this country work. It's what allows us to pursue our individual dreams. Being in Grant Park the night our first African-American president was elected was just the most incredible moment because up until that point, I think so many people still thought it was not possible. Are you prepared to take the oath, Senator? I am. I, Barack Hussein Obama. I, Barack Hussein Obama. His election didn't just happen, right? We came to that moment because we traveled this path from emancipation all the way through the civil rights movement to the day of his election. From the election of Oscar de Priest, the first black congressman from the North, to the elections of Mayor Harold Washington and Senator Carol Mosley Braun, from the campaigns of Jesse Jackson and the election of President Barack Obama, Chicago has shaped the political destiny of our nation. Let's take a look. My name 
is Brenda Gaines, and I had the honor and privilege of working with the late Mayor Harold Washington as a member of his administration. In September of 1983, I was tapped to head the city's Department of Housing. Later, I became his deputy chief of staff. To have known him is to have loved him. He would walk into a room and people would shout, Harold, Harold, Harold. And how did he reply? You want Harold? You got Harold. He could talk to anybody and he loved to talk to everybody. There will never be another Harold Washington. And while it was significant that he was Chicago's first African-American mayor, what's more important is the lasting effect that he had on Chicago. It is a history and a legacy that makes us all proud. My name is Valerie Jarrett, a former senior advisor to President Barack Obama. My relationship with Barack and Michelle started when Michelle was referred to me as a candidate to join the staff of Mayor Daley's office. That chance meeting led to a 26-year friendship that has transformed and enriched my life. Little did I know when we met that their commitment to public service would propel them to become the nation's first African-American president and first lady. Chicago's African-American community has always stepped up to push that arc towards justice, advocating for positive change. I grew up in South Kenwood, and I love Chicago's South Side. So does my mom, Barbara Bowman, who also grew up on the South Side and who is here with me tonight. There is something about this city that attracts excellence, and we need to nurture the next generation of leaders. Now let's find our voices. Let's unify. Let's engage with one another. Let's support one another and listen to one another and work together to ensure that our future is a bright one. I think one thing we proved tonight is that Chicago is much more than the headlines would indicate. It's more than police sirens and bullet holes. It is a town that gave birth to leaders and pioneers who took us from jazz clubs all the way to the White House, from juke joints to city halls, all the way to Hollywood. That's where the history makers come in. And just one night, we were only able to show you a small fraction of the entirety of the archives. But if we support this organization, the history makers, we can be sure to pass on the stories of our legacy from generation to generation. If we do that, we can reclaim our present and take control of the future. Thank you for being with us. See you on the other side. What can I say, therefore, when my child comes home with tears because a playmate has called him black, big-lipped, flat-nosed, or nappy-headed? What will he think when I dry his tears and whisper, yes, that's true, but no less beautiful and dear? How shall I lift his head, get him to square his shoulders, look his adversaries in the eye? Confident and the knowledge of his worth, serene under his sable skin and proud of his beauty. That he might survive, and survive he must, for who knows? Perhaps a black child here bears the genius to discover the cure for cancer? Or to chart the course for exploration of the universe. Tonight we have witnessed, all of us, our rich history through first-hand accounts. You see, our history is our future. We must pass the torch. It is time for a new generation of leaders to rise and carry on the traditions that have been laid before you. Who will be next? Is that you, or you, or you? If you accept this challenge, please stand up. If you accept this challenge, please stand up and say, I do. Let's move forward together. Thank you to the history makers. Thank you, Chicago. It has been a wonderful evening. Teresa Griffin, take us out with the song.
like you just don't care. Come on. Or like you care. For more information or to order your own copy of An Evening with the History Makers, Chicago Stories, please visit thehistorymakers.org or call 866-914-1900. The preceding program was funded in part by Toyota, AT&T, Baldwin Richardson Foods, Lincoln Financial Group, Apple, American Airlines. A complete list is available at thehistorymakers.org.